Good afternoon, and thank you for joining Presidential Global Game Changers online panel discussion, maintaining security in a disrupted environment and vulnerabilities and cascading consequences presented by the Rensselaer Silicon Valley Executive Council. A few housekeeping items before we begin. Please make sure your volume is turned all the way up. You will be muted throughout the presentation out of respect to our presenters. We received some questions during the registration process, and we will get to them as time allows during the Q&A portion of the program. I am now pleased to introduce our host for today's discussion, Dr. John Kapek of the classes of 1983, 1984, 1985, 1987 and 1988 is chair of the Rensselaer Silicon Valley Executive Council and Executive Vice President for Ventures at Abbott. Welcome, Dr. Kapek. Well, thank you. Uh, and welcome to the more than 100 attendees who join us for today's discussion. The Presidential Global Game Changers Panel online series are thought leadership discussions moderated by President Shirley Ann Jackson that feature topics of emerging global importance with alumni, alumnae, and faculty innovators in business, intellectual discovery, and entrepreneurship. Uh, each panel is presented by regional executive councils in key geographic regions where there are engaged alumni, alumni, and parents. Uh, today's discussion is on maintaining security in a distributed environment, uh, intersecting vulnerabilities, and cascading consequences and is presented by the Rensselaer Silicon Valley Executive Council where nearly 4,000 alumni, alumni and parents call home. I now have the incredible honor of introducing our moderator for today's discussion, the Honorable Shirley Ann Jackson, who served as the 18th president of Rensselaer Polytechnic since 1999. A theoretical physicist described by Time Magazine as perhaps the ultimate role model for women in science, Dr. Jackson has held senior leadership positions in academia, government, industry, and research. Dr. Jackson is the recipient of many national and international awards, including the National Medal of Science, the United States' highest honor for achievement in science and engineering. Most recently, the American Association of Physics Teachers announced Dr. Jackson as the 2021 recipient of the prestigious Hans Christian Orsted Medal which recognizes her exceptional contributions to physics, physics education, and the use of science in public policy. Dr. Jackson served as co-chair of the United States President's Intelligence Advisory Board, which assesses issues pertaining to the quality, quantity, and adequacy of intelligence activities from 2014 to 2017, and served as a member of the President's Council of Advisors on Science and Technology from 2009 to 2014. Before taking the helm at Rensselaer, she was chairman of the U.S. Nuclear Regulatory Commission from 1995 to 1999. Dr. Jackson serves on the boards of several major corporations that include FedEx and PSEG, where she is lead director. Dr. Jackson holds a BS in physics and a PhD in theoretical elementary particle physics, both from MIT. Since Dr. Jackson's arrival in 1999 to Rensselaer, she's brought truly an unprecedented transformation to our beloved Institute. Her numerous accomplishments include securing a $360 million gift towards the successful completion of a $1.4 billion capital campaign, increasing Institute research expenditures to 104 million, investing more than 800 million in facilities for research, teaching and student life, and hiring nearly 400 new faculty members, just to name a few. We can now also add to that, leading the Institute through a global pandemic and the unprecedented times with the safety of our students, faculty, and staff on campus as her absolute priority, resulting in one of the lowest infection rates in the nation. Dr. Jackson's represented Rensselaer across the globe through participation in numerous international events such as the World Economic Forum and has truly elevated the global presence of our alma mater. Dr. Jackson, it's a pleasure to welcome you here today. Thank you, Dr. Kapek, and good afternoon, everyone. A welcome to another in our Presidential Global, global Game Changers series. Today, we will consider maintaining in a disrupted environment 
and the intersecting vulnerabilities with potentially cascading consequences that can occur in a highly interconnected world when there is a triggering event. The disruptions I refer to, of course, include the COVID-19 pandemic and the necessity of remote work, a paradigm shifting event. A McKinsey survey of 900 corporate executives around the globe found that when compared to pre-crisis rates of adoption, they had accelerated the digitization of their customer supply chain and core internal operations by over three years in the space of a few short weeks and their digital offerings by seven years. The rapid move to a distributed workplace and the migration of operations to the cloud do not, however, uh, mean that these organizations are concomitantly prepared from a cybersecurity perspective. A recent massive cyber attack suspected by many to be Russian in origin provides a cautionary tale. An update to SolarWinds commercial networking software was used to compromise 18,000 public and private sector ent entities, including reportedly seven federal departments and the National Institutes of Health. More recent reports suggest that as many as 30% of the victims did not use SolarWinds software, so there are likely other vectors. Clearly, the pandemic is not the only disruption we are experiencing. Shifting geopolitics is another, as are political polarization and civil unrest in the United States, as well as escalating climate change and the extreme events associated with it. So how can we protect our increasingly digitized systems, institutions, governments, and economies from their many more, more vulnerabilities and angles of attack in an interconnected yet unsteady world? And this is a very large question. Fortunately, we have two experts here to help us to answer it. Our first guest is Rear Admiral Susan Breyer Joyner. She is Navy Cybersecurity Division Director in the Office of the Chief of Naval Operations. She received her commission in 1991 through the Naval Reserve Officer Training Corps at Rensselaer, where she earned a Bachelor of Science degree in materials engineering. She is one of over 70 Naval flag officers educated at Rensselaer from the mid 19th century to the present day, something we are very proud of. Our second panelist is Dr. James Hendler, director of the Rensselaer Institute for Data Exploration and Applications, or the Rensselaer IDEA, as well as the Tetherless World Senior Constellation Professor of Computer, Web, and Cognitive Sciences at Rensselaer. Professor Hendler also leads the Rensselaer IBM Artificial Intelligence Research Collaboration, the Rensselaer IBM Center for Health Empowerment by Analytics, Learning, and Semantics, and he is one of the originators of the Semantic Web. So Admiral Breyer Joyner, I will begin with you. The suspected Russian cyber attack exploited weaknesses in the commercial software supply chain, apparently for the purpose of espionage. What are the special challenges of information technology procurement in the military, and how do we address those challenges? Dr. Joyner, Dr. Jackson, thank you so much for inviting me to participate today. It's a true pleasure to be here with you. I would say that uh, the challenges that the military faces really aren't that different from those faced by private industry because, quite frankly, we shifted several decades ago from military spec equipment to commercial equipment. and. As a result, we experience many of the same vulnerabilities in our supply chain that private industry does. 
what I would say is depending on the level of the particular system, um, we may apply more measures, more protective measures, more cross-check measures uh, for those very critical systems than we would for, say, our unclassified networks. And so we try to take a very measured approach to make sure that the degree of security and investment we're making in protecting systems is commensurate with the level of mission criticality of those systems. So a follow on question. What does the Navy teach the users of its networks about protecting them? We start really the day folks come through the door, whether it's our civilian hires or our sailors as we uh, bring them into boot camp. One of the first things that we do before they can ever access the network is they get training about what the cybersecurity vulnerabilities are, what the threats are, and then really what kinds of actions they should and should not be taking. We have some, we have a user agreement. I'm sure it's pretty standard out there and that user agreement, uh, the user ag agrees to abide by certain rules and regulations as far as what websites they should not be going to, um, what types of actions they should not take on the network. And it starts with very basic cyber hygiene, right? If you get a notification that says, apply patch now or later, well, we would prefer that you apply patch now, uh, understanding that the workday may may delay it a little bit. We teach them about phishing and how you how you recognize a phishing attempt, how you thwart a phishing attempt. It's really not all that different from what we would expect any well-educated um, network user to understand. But what we find is because people are coming to the Navy from different backgrounds, they have varying levels of cyber uh, sophistication. And so we try and baseline that as folks come in and then reinforce that every year. We have annual training requirements and we're getting a little bit more proactive about the, not just computer-based training, but active events that we have through the year to test their responsiveness or um, sus susceptibility to phishing attacks. So, we're getting more sophisticated in our training as the adversary is getting more sophisticated in, in his approach. So, Henry, if you build out from uh, what the Admiral is saying, you know, people are important. And so, uh, attacks such as the one we're talking about rely on social as well as technological vulnerabilities. And what then are the cybersecurity challenges? of a distributed workplace when so many people are working from their kitchen tables. Uh, <clears throat> thank you, Dr. Jackson. Let me also quickly say what an honor it is to be with you and the Admiral as we go forward. Um, I think it's exactly that as people are working from home, many of those things that the Admiral uh, described, which are typically done in workplaces, become harder to maintain, harder to control, harder to keep an eye on. The same laptop may be being used by someone to do business work and then their child is using it for school and then someone else is using it for something else. So it gets, gets very hard, even if I've said, I won't use my laptop for this or that or the next thing, uh, if my child is going to completely different sites or, or using different things. So really the problem is a lot of the cybersecurity relies on knowledge and training that most people aren't getting and or are getting through the workplace. And now that that's coming home, it's hard to maintain that. Some of the kind of training the Admiral mentioned, like trying to do phishing attacks and things like that, become very um, questionable about releasing them in the wild rather than releasing them on a control network, that sort of thing. So, so it's really making things just much, much harder and schools and all these things. And there's things people can do, and I think we'll get to some of those later on, but you know, a lot of those people have been relying on their companies to do backups and security checks, and now people have to be just more aware of that. Speaking of companies, you know, there are some companies that uh, repel the solar winds attack. So, Jim, this is a follow-up. What lessons should we take then 
from those companies that were able to repel the solar winds attack. So I think we saw a lot of different things in that space, but I think the, the number one was that most of those companies tried to avoid being what we call a monoculture, having everybody using sort of the same kind of machine, the same kind of operating system, things like that. So if an attack is hitting one part of the company, people in other parts of the company may be able to notice it, notice different behaviors, things like that. Uh, the second thing we saw at almost all of those companies, and by the way, it's not just companies, I'm happy to say Rensselaer, uh, we didn't have any problem with that attack thanks to the wonderful work of Dr. Kolb and his team. But um, but specifically, we use a multi-level defense strategy. So different parts of our campus are under different levels of protection and even an attack that might hit somebody at home is going to be hard to get to campus and then it's going to be hard to get to any of the critical campus lessons. So most of the school, most of the places that really resisted the attack well were using those two things, many different kinds of computational systems and multi-level security. All right, Julia, that brings me back to you. Um, given the solar winds breach and the high probability of other cyber attack vectors being involved in the recent attack, how can we change our network architectures and what best practices should govern them? It's interesting because I will hearken back um, to the training that I got when I went to Naval Postgraduate School and I was studying with my thesis advisor on computer security. At the end of the day, when we program things, we should be programming to least privilege, right? We should not build applications that need full admin rights and uh, whitelisting in order for that application to work. The same thing applies to the various appliances. And as we look at industry and the speed and agility that, that they have fostered in their application deployments, too often security takes a little bit of a backseat because it's hard to develop an application that truly gets down to least privileges. And so as we, we hear the buzzword today, today of zero trust architecture, which quite frankly hasn't been codified to mean anything specific, we have many companies promising to deliver that particular characteristic. But if we refer to the principle of least privilege, we don't automatically trust anything. And there's a constant authentication to make sure that we are only letting trusted processes, trusted users into our system. And I think we'll talk about this a little bit later about new technology, new mechanisms that will help us get there. And so those basic least privilege, uh, that the application of least privilege and being brilliant at the basics, because every day, right, adversaries, whether they're criminal or espionage or whatever, are taking advantage of well-known, well-publicized vulnerabilities that have not been patched on the network. And it happens for two primary reasons. One is, for some reason, the overall scan patch scan process is not working well. And if that's not working well, your network is just an open book. The second piece, and this is a little bit more pernicious, is if you don't have good configuration management, and make sure that the latest known good image is what's being loaded or added to your network, you introduce new vulnerabilities when you have a computer that's just been repaired or a new computer that's just been added. And so if we can address those two aspects, right, making sure that we are current with our, with our patching and making sure that we've applied the principle of least privilege, I think those two changes absolutely help contain adversary uh, ability to elevate privileges and to pivot and maneuver throughout the network. Catching and least privilege. Thank you. So Professor Hendler, can you tell us about advanced research at Rensselaer, including 
and artificial intelligence to prevent such infiltrations? Sure, Dr. Jackson, and I'm going to just pick a couple of highlights because, of course, we have quite a lot going on here. Um, <clears throat> one area where we're doing a lot of work, so, so one of the ways a lot of bad things are coming into people's computers is through their use of the World Wide Web, and it's very necessary to use the work web to get work done, but that makes it something that is very tricky to secure for a lot of technical reasons. So we do a lot of work in there. And one of the interesting AI projects there has actually been ongoing for a long time. It's something that our my colleague Bulent Yenner is doing, um, looking at how we can use AI in malware detection. So the bad stuff that comes in through the web, if we could determine that was bad stuff and not good stuff, when you're streaming something, when you're downloading something, that's important. And so we typically use something which tries to recognize things we've already seen. So one person reports a problem and then, you know, it gets into the empty virals and that, but predicting that is very hard. So being able to say, hey, something funny is going on here. We haven't seen it before. That's a possible malware attack is something that AI systems are starting to get good at and where we've been a leader in doing some of that. Um, the other one that I, I think is really exciting is, so one of the, the problems that the Admiral just mentioned is keeping track of when you get some kind of warning that something's going in, knowing if that's something within your system. And a lot of those warnings come out in natural language for humans, not in a way that's computer readable or easily to map to your network. And so we're doing, we started a project jointly with IBM doing a lot of that kind of work and found it to be very successful. And then that actually led to something that I'm very excited by, and it's the last one I'll mention, is some work in insider threat. So the government spent last year over a billion dollars simply trying to make sure that systems that were government systems weren't being impacted by people within their networks. And that includes both people who have maliciously done that. I'm trying to steal information. I'm a disgruntled employee or, um, you know, somebody who's accidentally downloaded a phishing attack and doesn't even know that they're doing this. And um, there have been estimates that as much as 75 to 95 percent, depending exactly what you're measuring of the threat, comes from these kind of insider or inside the firewall is what we call it nowadays. And so we took the lang we took the natural language technique and actually applied it, something called recursive neural networks to the monitoring, the, the information you get in a network center, who, what things are doing what. And we were able to, to significantly um, improve the performance of systems on these insider attacks. So I think that's something that we're very excited uh, about. We're actually talking now to IBM about possible commercialization of some of that work. Department of Energy that among the targets of the attack were the National Nuclear Security Administration, which as you know, oversees the military applications of nuclear science and the nuclear stockpile. Although the intrusions were confined to the business network of the agency and not to mission essential national security functions. But with the advent of uh, Internet of Things technology, including in digital control systems and facilities management, cybersecurity now impacts physical security. What can you tell us? I know you can't tell us everything, but what can you tell us about the protection of critical national infrastructure from cyber attacks? Well, it's interesting because you would think um, that that would fall under the Department of Defense mission statement. But it turns out that the US Congress in 2018, they established a new organization. They, they essentially took an organization that was already doing a similar function, rebranded it and gave it some additional responsibilities. And it's called the uh, Cybersecurity and Information Security Agency, so CISA. And they're responsible not just for the cybersecurity of critical infrastructure, but also for the physical security of, of uh, critical infrastructure, which I think is important because too frequently when people think about cyber activity, 
they think it's only applying to things in the cyber realm. What we and DOD are well aware of is that cyber actions can have physical impacts to your point. And so CISA has that primary uh, responsibility for critical infrastructure. They work with the federal government, they work with the local governments, and they work with private industry to make sure that we are appropriately protecting the critical infrastructure because it, ex it, it extends well past the power grid. You know, it, it starts to go into um, water. People don't think water is all that important, but let me tell you, when water stops running, you can operate in a building for maybe a day before it becomes unsustainable. And so understanding the second and third order impacts when a piece of critical infrastructure goes down, understanding the resiliency and therefore understanding to what degree we need to censor and protect that particular piece of the infrastructure is what CISA works on and, um, and DOD, we do conduct exercises to figure out how we would be mobilized to support local governments and federal governments in the case of an attack. But that is not, we are not the lead, we are the supporting commander there. I understand. And, and so these internal linkages as well in this critical infrastructure is an example of what I would, or, you know, uh, what I would refer to as the intersecting vulnerabilities where things can cascade through. So Professor Henler, as my question to the Admiral suggests, critical national infrastructure necessarily then extends to cyber physical systems. So how are breakthroughs in artificial intelligence, which you just spoke of, and quantum computing, both a threat and a protection for such systems? Uh, as you often say, these, um... New technologies seem to have both, you know, they're, they're two edged swords. They can be used both to protect and to attack. And both of those technologies are, are very much in that space. A, a colleague of mine once joked that two of his key research projects, one is blockchain to make it so that we have unbreakable uh, data and quantum to break blockchain. So, you know, we have these kind of situations where we're trying to, um, look at these new technologies and see where we can deploy them. Quantum technology grew out of a large investment by the government over a long time, largely because it can be used to break codes for technical reasons. We're going to talk more about that in a few okay. minutes. But and so, at, so really, so really quickly, you know, the answer is a lot of these systems, the water systems, the electrical systems, there was an attack on a water plant uh, about 10 miles away from the Super Bowl this on last Friday where they, rather than trying to turn off the water, were actually um, trying to manipulate a, a chemical that would actually have turned it into a poisonous water system. And luckily the controllers were able to find that. So um, a lot of what we're trying to do now in, in some of the research space is how do we model these things? So how can we learn to protect against these new technologies if we don't learn to um model what's going on we don't until the attack happens we don't know what the attack looked like we have to be able to know beforehand if we're going to protect it and that's a lot of what we're using artificial intelligence to help us monitor determine uh those attacks and other people are using it to try to identify attacks so it's a it's a real challenge in that two-edged sword can you tell us in general terms about how weapon systems are protected from cyber attacks. So in general terms, um, we apply many of the same principles and it all starts when, when we're um, acquiring or developing the weapon systems. We really do try to embed cybersecurity best practices to the maximum extent possible, understanding that for most of those instances, if it comes to a choice between cybersecurity or mission capability, mission capability is going to win out. And so during the acquisition cycle, we try to build it into the design. We validate how effective it is by doing periodic testing through the operational test and evaluation cycle. 
And then when it's fielded, every weapon system has a variety of protections in place, either by the degree of its lack of connect connectedness, which is not a complete protection, but it does add some protection to defense and depth measures. And so what, um, what Dr. Hendler referred to as um, multi-level security, we refer to as defense and depth because every layer that we can put monitoring and defensive measures and detection measures in place, we do. And so we're able to make sure that our weapon systems, if they're vulnerable in a particular aspect, that we monitor for any potential incidents detect them as quickly as possible, and then take the requisite counter actions to protect the system. I would offer that when I, when I talk about vulnerability assessments, you know, some of these systems are based on commercial technology. So we're talking literally scan, patch, scan. Um, others are not as, um, as suitable for the scan, patch, scan technology. And so we do vulnerability assessment, assessments, which can start with engineering reviews, it can be a cyber tabletop exercise, it can be an actual penetration test. And so we're constantly, you know, we're rotating, we can't focus on any one system to the, um, to the detriment of another, but we're constantly assessing and fixing and monitoring for, um, for attacks. And we're also looking at indicators, right? We look at what's happening in public and private industry, and we look at the information that's available to determine if an adversary has an intent to attack a particular weapon system and how they might choose to, um, to approach it. So many different actions that all interface together to hopefully make sure that that critical capability is available when we need it. about cyber physical systems or the, the migration of more transactional processing to the cloud. As, as the devices in our world grow smarter, uh, Professor Hendler, what are the particular cybersecurity challenges attached to edge computing? And also, are there particular opportunities in this space that we can think about? And once again, of course, the answer is yes, both threats and uh, opportunities. I think at the moment we're a little more worried about the threats, um, largely because the cost performance trade-offs are such that to really build some of these things very securely would make them cost significantly more. So if a secure cell phone would cost you $3,000 for $300, very unclear how many people would, would think that's worthwhile investment. And as, as these edge devices, as we call them, become increasingly life critical. So for example, one of the studies I've been involved in that I can't talk about in detail is with medical devices. And so, you know, what happens when, so, so nowadays a diabetic will typically have something implant or may have something implanted to either control an insulin pump or just make it so they can monitor their blood glucose on a continuous level that talks out to their cell phone, which in turn is reporting uh, health information back to their doctors. So AI systems allow the autonomy of some of those embedded systems to stay there and monitor what's happening and set the right kind of levels and things. But at the same time, we're not so sure how to, how to protect some of these autonomous AI systems. That's also an issue that the military worries a lot. As we add more intelligence, if that's creating new threats, we have to find ways to assess that. So we have kind of both sorts of research going on now, how to use AI to protect things, but also how to use AI <clears throat> in an embedded case so that we can start exploring, you know, how would people attack it and what would you do about that? What's interesting is when we talked about water supplies, the attempt to poison the water supply, the water supply in Florida, I immediately started thinking about sensors, smart sensors that might give us some very early sense of something untoward happening and potentially shutting down uh, 
you know, the, a water supply. And so that's really as both the threat, but there, then there is potentially the protective opportunity. Mm -hmm. So Professor Henley, let me ask you one other question in the quantum realm. You know, there's quantum computing and there's quantum communications. They clearly have a common physics route, but they are different. So extending beyond pure quantum computing, how will quantum communications change the nature of cybersecurity? And then Dr. Uh, uh, Rear Admiral, I'm going to then ask you, do quantum communications, at least as you understand it, offer opportunity to our military? So, Professor. So, so, so quantum communications is a very rapidly evolving field. And <clears throat> very quickly to sum up what happens is not so much that you can't break into a quantum communication line, but you can tell if it's been broken into. So somebody who is monitoring that line can know that somebody who's not allowed to have seen the message, and it gets into very complex probabilities and math and physics to make it work. The physics challenge is distance. So, you know, about 10 years ago, seven miles of of a quantum communication over a fiber was the state of the art. Now we're actually seeing demonstrations of it going to satellites in space and back down to earth and things like that. However, there's a lot of infrastructure investment needed before this would really be the commercial technology, but it's very exciting from the point of view, particularly these kind of control systems we've just been talking about, because you could know for sure that the device has produced something that now is being monitored somewhere else and that nobody has broken in in the middle to, to corrupt that. So that's really the biggest excitement of the quantum uh, communications. Of course, a big part of that is developing the right kind of materials and things like that, <clears throat> excuse me, to extend the distance and to keep that going. And that's something where several of our faculty at RPI are, are heavily involved with. And if anyone wants details of that, I can put them in touch with uh, Musa, Dr. Musa or, or someone else. We have a lot of good people here. So that sounds extremely exciting. And I would say in the military, there would be very specific use cases where um, quantum communications would be key. Nuclear command and control would, be, I think, come to everybody's mind as something that we absolutely need to make sure has utmost uh, security. The interesting thing, at least in the Navy, right, when you look at the way we operate on ships, on the ocean, obviously don't have fiber trailing behind us, uh, reliant on satellite communications, where bandwidth ends up being the biggest constraint and the adversary's ability, or quite frankly, the weather's ability to deny us that bandwidth uh, definitely plays a part. I think until quantum uh, communications is able to be supported in a relatively light uh, footprint and something that can survive what we call a de um, denied disrupted, degraded environment. It will have minimal application to at least the Navy. The Air Force may be a little bit more because they, they tend to be a little bit more garrison based and and um, and again focused on the nuclear. But that that's exciting. I mean, secure communications is absolutely where we need to be able to get for those things that need it. our concerns do not uh, begin and end with controlled and classified data in uh, secure networks. Uh, in the military, open data can pose security challenges. Can you tell us how you think about that? Absolutely. So we have what we call controlled unclassified information. Um, and what that means is it, it shouldn't be available to the general public, and that includes our adversaries, because you're able to 
gather all of these different indicators together and all of a sudden, instead of having just one piece of information that doesn't mean a whole lot on its own, now you have a pretty comprehensive narrative about something that's happening. And in the past, that wasn't as big a challenge, one, because we weren't as interconnected, but two, we didn't have the computing power that was necessary in order to take advantage of those massive amounts of data. Now between the computing power, the power of AI, machine learning, um, and just the population in some of these countries that are opposing us, it becomes a huge challenge. And so we call it operation security. And what that means is before you share information openly, whether it's on Facebook or Twitter, or you geotagged your photo, right? Think hard about how the adversary or somebody else could use that information in order to target your unit or your family is where we're getting to sometimes these days. And I would offer, it's not just a military problem, right? When we look at industry, when we look at the defense industrial base, everybody has information that they would probably prefer to stay under wraps um, and an uneducated, uneducated or, um, or employee or someone who maybe wasn't paying enough attention really let something key drop. We, I think we've seen it with uh, some Apple products getting leaked before they were ready to be announced. And, and we see it in many different areas. So I think operation security, the importance of protecting even unclassified, what we wouldn't consider sensitive information is extremely important. As you're talking, what's clear is how that open or, or you know, sensitive but unclassified information might be put together. And, and I see an opportunity, and I'd love to have an extended conversation with you about it one of these days, to use AI and as well as the kind of behavioral modeling that we're able to do uh, with data and data analytics, but all together with the computational power we have here, to be able to tease out where the vulnerabilities would lie in a given scenario of the leakage or the inadvertent leakage of some personal information that may nominally seem innocent, but when the, the pieces are put together can be overly revelatory. And so I, I happen to think it's a real question, as you point out, it's a, it's a real challenge, but I also think that those same capabilities that allow others to put these things together can potentially allow us to preemptively put these things together so we know where the vulnerabilities may be. Exactly. So I'm going to come to you in a second, Jim. I do have a, a, a question again for uh, Admiral Breyer Joyner that's somewhat different than what we've been talking about. Now, as we consider the disruptions influencing cyber, national, and global security, and the danger of nation state interference, climate change, as it is playing out in the melting Arctic, is another factor. And so, what are the challenges posed by climate change to our national security and, frankly, to our global military posture? I'm actually going to start with a mundane example, right? As we're talking about global warming and we're talking about rising ocean levels, let's think about where Navy bases are located. Um, they generally tend to be oceanside. And, uh, and so some of our facilities are actually seeing the effects of rising or erratic um, weather patterns, rising waters or erratic weather patterns. And so from a very practical mundane um, aspect, the Navy is very concerned about global warming. What that has done, and it, it ties into our Chief of Naval Operations, has a concept called Distributed Maritime Operations. It has a firm foundation in our ability to um, communicate across distance and with different partners, and it extends into 
being able to operate wherever, whenever we need to on in the globe with our partners. And so when you talk about um, when you talk about global warming and you talk about the Arctic Circle starting to open up, we have very good partners that are very well practiced in operating in that area. The Norwegians, um, we had the opportunity to deploy with them when I went out in 2019, and they are just masters at their craft. And they helped us understand, right, reintroduced us to operating in waters that were very different than uh, what we had become accustomed to in the, in the, uh, the Middle East. Right, so our focus has changed and as a result, our operating environment has changed dramatically, uh, at least on the East Coast. And then in the Pacific, we've always been open ocean focused because there's nothing else. And uh, and now though, we have to worry about the, tra the transition of forces from the Pacific to the Atlantic via a route that had not previously existed. And so being able to extend our communications, being able to protect those lines of communications as we are conducting distributed maritime operations is really a key component of what our Chief of Naval Operations is focused on. That's another one of these questions where we could do a global game changers panel just on, on some of that. <laughs> Not to mention the effect of, uh, of, of climate change uh, and on where our fleet can be stationed uh, and even in other places around the world. But also the opening of these Arctic routes. Um, it's interesting from a, a geopolitical perspective because most people don't understand that we don't have most of the coastline there. There are countries like Norway, Canada, Russia. And so it's, it's an interesting geopolitical consideration. But as I said, we could talk about that forever, but thank you. That's very illuminating. And let me ask you this uh, last question, and then we'll move to some that have come from uh, our audience today. You know, at Rensselaer, we have a, a student computer security club called RPI Sec, and we're very proud of it because it's come in first in recent years in global capture the flag competitions. You know, these are, you know, uh, cybersecurity games. And so given that we have, you know, this kind of interest here and capability in our students, a uh, number of whom may be our future cyber defenders, what advice uh, would you offer to them um, at this moment, uh, given what you know and, and what your career has been about? You know, that's it. Well, first, congratulations to the program because that's a tremendous accomplishment and and I'm very proud to to belong to a, a college that has made that or a university that has made that progress. So that that's tremendous. Um, I have one pretty rote piece of advice and then I've got a couple pieces that that probably aren't intuitive. First, I think we all need to strive for excellence in whatever field we're in. Right. Progress starts with a good foundation in whatever field you're in. And without that, you're not going to be able to make sustained progress. It'll be fits and starts because you may go down some false routes if you were not fully aware of, of everything that's going on. Um, but the two that I would say are slightly different is also seek opportunities to broaden your exposure to other fields. When we talk about innovation, innovation doesn't happen in a vacuum. It usually happens when two, two areas of expertise hit an intersection and then you go, oh, we could use this, which is standard in my field, to do this, which is standard in my field, and it's a different approach. So I think that's incredibly important. And the Navy has really helped me with that because for those who aren't familiar, just because my, my um, so you'll note my degree was in materials engineering, have not done one lick of that in the Navy. They sent me to a job that was focused on needs of the Navy, which was back in the day, automated data uh, protection security. So ADP security or processing security and fell in love with it, right? It is, 
but every job is something different. I don't just do ADP security. I do communications. I do networks. I do, and so over the years, I've been able to bring different approaches in from each one of the jobs to help uh, to help make progress. And that ties into the third thing that I'd like to raise, and it's really important, I think, these days. We need to embrace diversity, and it's not just diversity in where you grow up, grew up, or what degree you're in. It is diversity in the way I think and the way that my husband thinks are completely different. The way that I think and the way that my deputy thinks, completely different. And so there's a little bit of friction sometimes as you're trying to figure out how to communicate, but it also keeps you from staying in a stovepipe. It leads to new insights, it leads to different approaches, and ultimately I think it leads to better solutions than other, when you look at some of the other countries that, that are our near peer competitors, they're very stovepiped. They don't value diversity. And our people is where we have the competitive advantage. So embrace diversity. And if you don't have it organically, seek it out. I think those are the three areas that I would encourage them to focus. So I'm going to ask you uh, two rapid fire questions. Uh, one to you, Jim. How secure are class tests and student information at Rensselaer? This is from a parent. I'm, I'm happy to say quite secure. Um, I mentioned before the great work done by our uh, Chief Information Officer and VP for Information Technology uh, Information Services, uh, John Kolb, and his team has really taken that very seriously. We also um, recently released a report, it's available on the website, on some of the pedagogical innovations that have happened over the past year, and one of those actually looked at how some of our professors are even varying how we give tests. So not just the security from the, the results being secure, but how are we making sure in this distributed world, people aren't cheating and things. So we're very aware of the issue and we're doing quite a lot, but our security is quite good at the moment. And I would add that student information is essentially kept in its own information vault with essentially zero trust as the basis for how it's handled. Absolutely. So rapid fire to you, these aren't easy questions, but rapid fire nonetheless. Uh, Admiral, do you believe that a shift to uh, blockchain or distributed ledger technology will strengthen our security? I think it has the potential to strengthen our security. And in the, the theme that we've heard is both an opportunity and a threat because as it strengthens our ability to protect things. It also strengthens criminals and others' ability to protect their stuff. So, right. <laughs> so that leads me to your rapid fire answer, Professor Hendler. Will it strengthen our privacy? You know, there, uh, who? You got to answer. Yeah, 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 the answer fast, I know. Um, the answer is, again, same, almost the same thing. It has potential to do a lot and it has potential to let people exchange private information without us knowing. So it, you know, it, it makes it very hard to police or monitor what's going on. And so it's a hard area. There's some very exciting new privacy preserving technologies we're starting to explore here. And that would be another great <laughs> global game changer someday. So let me ask you, uh... This question, it's really to both of you, but I'll start with you, Admiral, because it was not just companies, but uh, government entities. And it's the uh, question that many people ask, you know, how did 18,000 uh, Fortune 500 companies and a number of government entities, some that likely spend hundreds of millions of dollars annually on cyber and information security, uh, how did those that were using this infected solar winds orion version of their software miss the intrusion for months i think it clearly demonstrates the danger of supply chain vulnerabilities because solaris winds was a trusted application the adversary took advantage of a supply chain vulnerability to leverage that trust, those trusted relationships. And so, again, least privileged principles had, had companies had it in place and the Navy had it in place, 
they were able to contain the damage um, because many of those require a two-way communication. And if you have things set properly, you may have been infected, but they may not have been able to close that command and control loop. So least privilege. This actually loops through everything in a way we've talked about today, which has to do with uh, procurement, supply chains, uh, zero trust. But Jim, you know, being a computer scientist and a world-class one at that, um, you know, a lot of these applications, and, and the Admiral mentioned using commercial products more, commercial software, you know, there are a whole uh, community of developers that companies use. And so how does this question of zero trust work in that kind of environment? So there's a very interesting new piece of research we've been starting. I didn't talk about it earlier. And it, it's basically, how do we bring cost into the whole discussion? Because what's really driving the supply chain issue is we're looking for a cheap place to build it so that the eventual device or the eventual system can be kept cheaper. And we have never factored that into sort of our engineering diagrams from a security and privacy point of view. We have certainly put it in from a development point of view. So we're really looking now at, you know, where are those trade offs? So if you go to a third party in another country to develop a piece of your code because it's cheaper, what must be put into the system so that when it comes back in, it could be tested at a cost that's not higher than if you develop it yourself? and those sorts of things. So we're really looking at how those trade-offs can be exploited for good rather than causing the problems. That out for us, right? I said, you're gonna work that out for us. We're working on it. <laughs> well, I'm afraid that uh, we've come to the end of our time. Uh, I know there were a number of questions and I wanna thank everyone who submitted questions uh, we tried to incorporate some of them into our earlier discussion, and but they were very thoughtful, and thank you very much. I want to express great gratitude to Admiral Breyer Joyner and Professor James Hendler for a very thought-provoking and a very important discussion. And uh, you've actually added a lot of insights to my thinking uh, as we're undertaking major initiatives in artificial intelligence and machine learning, uh, and looking to marry all of those in a big initiative that it combines data, artificial intelligence, and computing uh, that covers everything from traditional von Neumann-based high-performance computing to neuromorphic computing to quantum computing. And so this helps to inform what we do. And uh, Admiral, I want to say we have, a, have had, as you know, a strong and long-lasting uh, relationship with the U.S. Navy, uh, having produced so many flag officers and general officers for the Navy and for the military generally. And uh, so we're very proud of you and what you're doing. And, and it's very important to our country. And, and we, it's very important to have you as an alumna of Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute. Thank you so much. And Professor Hendler, uh, you know we love you, uh, and you're going to solve all these problems for us. Absolutely. So Real quick. Thank you all, and good afternoon. Thank you to Dr. Jackson, our panelists, and attendees for joining us today. You will be receiving an email within the next few days with a link to today's recording, along with a brief survey back to help us in planning for future virtual events. We are particularly interested in hearing what topics would be of interest to you, preferred timeframes, and other details that will be helpful as we plan. Thank you in advance for your input and be sure to check your email moving forward for upcoming virtual events. Please also follow the Rensselaer Institute Advancement YouTube channel for all previous virtual event recordings, as well as past Rensselaer Global Game Changers online panel discussions. Save the date for the next Presidential Global Game Changers panel online on March 25th, presented by the Rensselaer New England Executive Council, and virtual reunion and homecoming from April 14th through 16th. 
Celebrating classes ending in zero and five, all are welcome, featuring a presidential state of the institute, class student panel, and presidential global game changers panel online. Watch your email for details. Finally, now more than ever, support is needed to continue the exceptional tradition of Rensselaer education for our incoming and current students. Please visit our website to learn how you can support Rensselaer students. Thank you, stay safe and healthy, have a great rest of your day.